All right. August 27th, 2010, Oakland, California. A, the police receive an anonymous tip, and there's a suspected gang member named Andrew Barrientos, this guy. And he has two warrants out for his arrest, and so a bunch of police officers go, and they confront him, and he ends up shooting this officer, Officer Todd Young. Uh, so what's interesting about this is that when they actually went out into his court trial, he claimed that this officer shot first. But what actually ended up happening is that Oakland had deployed a network of microphones called Shot Spotter. And what this system did is that whenever a gunshot sounded, the microphones here would triangulate exactly where the gunshot happened and when, send it to police, and then the police would be able to be deployed there. In this case, using this data, they were able to confirm that Barrientos actually shot the officer first, shot him about 10 times. And as a result, he is now serving a life sentence for attempted murder of a police officer. So it's stories like these that really enrapture many throughout the world about the idea of smart, city, smart cities and really making technology make cities more powerful. So today we're going to be talking about this incredibly vague buzzword that really, we have no idea what they are. Like, very few people actually understand what it is, and it's very difficult to classify it into some singular definition. So let's look at a couple. This is the one that IBM gives. Um, a city that makes optimal use of all interconnected information available today to better understand and control its operations and optimize the use of limited resources. Here's another one from a consulting company named Frost & Sullivan. Um, they kind of just list a bunch of things. And then here's my most, here's my favorite one. This is from the Ministry of Housing from the Republic of India. And the way that I kind of take this to mean is they're not entirely sure either. Smart cities is an incredibly vague concept. So today we're going to narrow it down. We're only going to be talking about two aspects. Deploying these uh, sensors, smart sensors, measurement devices, and then using and analyzing this data in order to improve the city in some way. All right, is everyone good with that definition for now? Great, so let's start talking about the kind of things that collecting this data and using it can do. Um, probably the biggest idea here is just the more that you know about your city, the more you can do. So for example, if you went onto this site, uh, crimecards.dc.gov, if you want to, go ahead. Um, basically, you can just click on it. Let's see if I can do this without interrupting my flow. And it looks like I can. And if you load it up, what it actually end up doing is give you this like very rich, very well-documented crime data. And then, for example, I want to find out, like, in the past three months, um, how many times have you had a car theft? And it'll actually show you exactly, like, where is most likely and kind of, like, some more interesting statistics. So this is, like, kind of a commonplace thing nowadays, having this, like, very rich police data. Uh, and then we can also talk about how, like, we use that data. Obviously, we have uh, predictive policing nowadays. Where did my mouse go? All right. Uh, predictive policing like PredPol, which I believe um, Professor Helding talked about a couple weeks ago. So I'm not going to talk too much about it now, but I just want to say that a lot of smart city data is very useful in making predictive policing collect more data and maybe collect like more uniform data that is less self-serving, uh, less self, I forget the word, but like less biased. So it can also help in that sense. And then finally, we can talk about city efficiency. I know, less interesting topic, but I find it really cool. So Barcelona is kind of the big um, cent center prototype of this, where every th they've really been deploying very aggressively a lot of different sensors. For example, a lot of their trash bins now have sensors that tell how full they are. So what they can do is 
take that information about how full they are and optimize the trash truck route in order to minimize the amount of time that you have to spend driving this truck around collecting trash. They have lights that are set up so that they only turn on when there is somebody within a couple blocks of the light so that they're not on all the time, saving an incredible amount of electricity. And they also have traffic lights that are very responsive to buses and emergency services. This is something that people have been talking about for a lot of years, and Barcelona has actually implemented. So, like, if you're driving, if you're on a bus, what will end up happening is they, actually, the bus can send a signal to the traffic light to turn green before it goes. So the bus can go faster, thus making public transportation much, much stronger in Barcelona. This has led to a lot of benefit for Barcelona. You can see they save 58 million on water, they gain 50 million in parking revenue, and they're generating jobs and saving even more money through power savings. Oh, sorry. Um, so this is like, using all this data can lead to an incredible amount of efficiency in cities, meaning that you're, save, you're getting more money and you're saving money, and that means that you can use it elsewhere in places like homelessness, in places like, um, in places like, um, uh, like welfare that you couldn't otherwise use for basic city functions. On the other hand, you also have a bunch of um, companies that want to do somewhat the same thing, where they want to know how are people going to use things like electric cars. So for example, this is the American Electric Power Ohio. They're setting up electric charging stations so that you know exactly where, like they know exactly where they should put these and how many of them to put and like what kind to use so that when electric vehicles become big, they will actually be well used and they can actually make this much more profitable than it would have been, allowing alternative energy and electric cars to really prosper. And I'd be remiss if I weren't talking about self-driving cars. Uh, self-driving cars, like Jacqueline talked about uh, last week, really need a lot of data, especially in cities where the rules can be very confusing and very specialized. So having all this data is also very useful for electric cars. Okay. So that's the promise. Let's talk a little bit about like a lot of the kind of the issues that also exist. The biggest one, the most obvious one, is privacy. You're literally putting a sensor in your trash can. How is this not going to be somewhat of a privacy concern? And while it's very easy to dodge around this saying like, we're going to make sure that somebody is monitoring this data, that we're going to collect less data, et cetera, et cetera, it's actually a lot harder than that. For example, in Stanford, they actually found a way to use the fiber optic cables under the campus in order to listen in on conversations, in order to sense footsteps, etc. It's really easy to take information that is like publicly available and use indirectly derive a lot of other information. One of my professors at home actually uh, published a paper about how they're able to tell what um, when you're home and like when your kid is like crying or not just based off of your internet usage patterns because of the way that IoT devices only use the internet when like, they trigger in some way. The other issue is that with all this public data coming out, it's really easy to misuse. So this is a pretty funny example, I thought, but in Amsterdam, where they also have a lot of smart city initiatives, one thing that ended up happening in the first couple of years is someone made an app and published it that actually told you the best houses to burgle in Amsterdam based off of what has, the, what has no street lights, what houses are high property, and which houses are far away from the police station. So you can see, like, this data can be used, is a really powerful tool, but can be misused if put in the wrong hands. Fortunately, this was kind of a joke. Um, and I could not find any screenshots of it online, so I take that to be a good sign. <sighs> yeah. Um, and then I think one of the biggest issues, one of the most subtle ones, is kind of the process of these things. Companies are largely the ones that are driving um, a lot of smart city innovations because those are the ones that are actually developing the technologies rather than you know, the governments themselves. And this is often problematic because they're private. And their incentives are not necessarily completely aligned with the cities. And as a result, they're not really going to be looking out for people's interests so much as they're looking out for making something sexy and making something that will sell. Uh, so, like, let's look back at IBM's quote here. Optimal use of all interconnected information, control its operations, limited resources. 
the way that they're defining a smart city is really strategic for them because IBM is an efficiency, is an optimization, is an information consulting company. So they are literally branding themselves to be perfect for smart cities. In fact, IBM owns the trademark in the U.S. for smart cities. So there you go. A larger, another issue, which is I think a bit smaller, though, is that there's this thing called the personal itch paradox. I made that up entirely. Don't try Googling it. Um, but the idea is that a lot of times when people are coming up with, like when brilliant engineers are coming up with issues, what are they going to look at? They're going to look at what is the thing that like, actually bugs them the most. And that means that you're not necessarily getting the right sympathy. So for example, if you've ever heard of Leap Transit, this was a bus company in San Francisco that literally just made a really expensive bus for like, well-paid software engineers to climb on, purchase Greek yogurt and some cactus water, and converse with their fellow engineers, which is kind of, when you think about it, as a smart city move, kind of a waste. Because why are you, waste, why are you spending money helping engineers feel slightly better about their lives when San Francisco has one of the most visible homeless populations in the country and in the world? And back to, the corp back to other corporation issues, we also see things like watchdogs. With security, there's a huge incentive against necessarily putting on great security because actually the way the U.S. law is set up, companies are a lot less liable, aren't like actually liable for security issues if they aren't on the device. So you put everything into the cloud and the cloud is easily hackable, then that means that the companies aren't necessarily going to do anything, and meanwhile, everything is easily attacked. This is taken to a logical extreme in this video game, Watch Dogs from 2013, in which you have this kind of cyberpunk reality, and this guy... I saw something. It's just no able to hack into any part of the city to me. and control it in the most badass way ever. Now, I'm coming for them. So those are some of the issues that I personally found really disturbing or relevant to kind of smart cities. And I think that it's really interesting when you bring it back into kind of the case that we were talking about earlier, ShotSpotter. Uh, and let's look at kind of the news issues that have shown up since that arrest in Oakland, California. First we see that in three years later, Oakland cops are actually trying to get rid of the system, even though there's a lot of success stories. And this is because they said it's a waste of money. They're not really, they want to do other things. Um, actually, the article mentioned it's, they want a helicopter. But yeah, the other issue is that a lot of people in Oakland are very distrusting of the police. And so the police say you can just call 911, but people in Oakland don't want to call 911 because they don't trust the police to protect them when they call. And so what ends up happening is that ShotSpotter will detect a gunshot and then route it to the police without anyone having to do it for them, without any person in the area having to call the police, which means the officers can still respond to this issue without needing anybody to trust the police. And a lot of people were actually very upset when the police wanted to get rid of it for that exact reason. We also find that even though ShotSpotter claimed that you can't actually get recordings of the conversations and all it does is detect the gunshot, it actually does turn out that ShotSpotter has been recording audio and this audio has been used in court. So it's very clear that they basically lie to us about their information collection practices. And this is like, this goes back to the same issue about how, can we really trust these corporations to care about our security and privacy and, but like what? And like, what kind of alternatives are there to this model? Uh, finally, we see that gun crime actually stopped, starts dropping in Oakland. And some people attribute this to ShotSpotter 
because you can't get away with shooting a gun in the middle of Oakland anymore, and just because you're far away in the middle of the slums of the city, that you can just get away with it. But the issue is there's also a lot of contention around that. In another city, Newark, this, the exact opposite happened. With ShotSpotter, the amount of gun violence has actually increased. So there's a lot of efficacy issues and a lot of debate over whether or not collecting data is inherently useful at all even. So that's kind of the issues that we're going with ShotSpotter. And now let, we can take a look a little bit at maybe where um, the process is and like maybe how they manage to fail listening to people or maybe succeed it. So let's look at a couple of the issues that we have. One, uh, we have all these questions. For example, what data should be collected, how it can be used, uh, policies that can be enforced, and who's responsible. So I'm saving these for a discussion, but what's important to note now is that every city needs to do set up these answers on their own because every city has different values and different ideals, and that makes it incredibly difficult to create a one-size-fits-all solution like many corporations would want. So we see nowadays, if we look at the way that stakeholders are set up, the way that it's usually a process instead of a, actually everybody comes to the table and talks. And it's really this process, where these companies like IBM, like Google, are coming up with these solutions that can be massively scaled, deployable, et cetera, bring it to the government, which then brings it to residents. And this leads to a lot of problems because these companies are, again, looking out for bottom line. They're not necessarily incentivized to listen to the residents and that means that when they're talking to the government, they're not going to be talking about, oh, this is going to help this certain marginalized population. They're going to be talking about the benefit of efficiency like we see in Barcelona, et cetera. And so really, I, this is my opinion, but I think one of the biggest things we can do to improve smart city infrastructure is to try to push towards this model, where the government is kind of mediating between contractors, uh, companies, and residents, and really allowing these residents, especially the underrepresented ones, um, really have a say in what the government would accept from a company rather than it going the other way around where the company proposes something and creates kind of these solutions for problems that maybe they made up, but NEP definitely did not coordinate around a certain city to do. All right, uh, that is my talk. Thank you.